the room. I think more people are still coming. Uh, so we're, we're, we're actually the 100 version. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, webinar for the School of Earth Sciences uh, 2020. Um, so today is our great honor and pleasure to have a professor, uh, David Kochler, speaking with us. So David had uh, got his PhD quite a long time ago at uh, UIUSD. <laughs> Okay, interestingly, here we uh, School of Earth Science has a very close collaboration with UIUC. We used to travel to UIUC for summer schools every year uh, with a class of 20 to 30 students, uh, spend about one month at UIUC every year before the COVID. Uh, but, but of course, now it, it only occurred online. And, and then uh, uh, David traveled to uh, uh, Cavendish uh, um, uh, Laboratory for his postdoc before he uh, went to MIT to start his career in rock physics. Uh, so including deriving to the topic that he's going to talk today a little bit. So D David spent part of his career in, at Corn uh, Cornell and most of his career actually at the University of Minnesota. Uh, so David has uh, deformed rock, different types of rocks, uh, but today he's going to talk more about melt. Uh, so with that, I will give the rest on to David. So David, uh, we are going to have two lectures, each lecture about 20, 45 minutes, and then we're going to take a break between these two lectures with 10 minute break. So everyone feel free to uh, uh, send your question in the chat. Um, uh, the, during the talk is okay. So then we are, uh, I'm going to read the questions during the break um, or, or at the end of the second lecture. So with that, David, please. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, there it is, I lost my mouse. All right, so I thought at one point I should subtitle this talk to be something like Extraction of Melt from Earth's Mantle, the view from the lab, because mostly what I'm going to talk about today are laboratory experiments and what we can learn by rather simple experiments about how melt might be transported through the mantle from the source region to Earth's surface. So for me, and maybe for most of us, our experience with molten rocks that is magmas and lava is based on images, maybe on the evening news or on the internet, of volcanic eruptions such as this one over Iceland in 2010. And you see an airplane flying through or above the magma eruptions. Um, and I don't know if you, you probably are all too young to remember, but this eruption pretty much shut down air travel between North America and Europe at the time because it cut off a lot of the, the, the vulnerable or the logical paths for planes to fly. And we also see volcanic eruptions, of course, in places like Hawaii, um, away from a mid-ocean ridge. But today, I'm going to focus primarily on one simple or one important geological setting, and that's the mid-ocean ridge, and ask something about how do we get melt from the mantle source region which might be a hundred or more kilometers below the surface and get it to erupt at our surface. And I'll look at the various processes and pathways that are involved and try to bring some experimental observations to bear um, on, the processes, on, the, on the processes and transport um, from deep to, to shallow depths. And I'm gonna ultimately really focus on the central part of this transport, so very deep, 100 kilometers or so, maybe a little bit deeper, melting begins, and it might be a very small amount of melt, maybe 1% melt, maybe less, but then somehow rises and it ends up in a magma chamber. And then the top part we know quite a bit about because you can make observations of rocks that have been deformed up here by the injection of melt. So there's typically brittle fracture at the top, the pressures are low, the temperatures are relatively low, and the magma can hydrofracture or magma fracture the way through the rocks, forming dikes and other brittle features. And the lowest part down in here where porous flow occurs, we have some idea how that occurs and takes place. But for me, most of the work we've done has been in this intermediate section where there has to be some sort of channelized flow. Okay, so that's kind of the problem. Um, we know there has to be channelized flow in here because of some chemical aspects of the magmas that get erupted. We can see that the magma is out of equilibrium with the surrounding rock. And so if you're flowing by partial melting and by porous flow down and below, 
the intimate contact between the melt and the grains mean that there should be chemical equilibrium, but there's not. When you look at the, what comes out the top, the magma that comes out is not in equilibrium with the peridotite or the layers of light that exists down in this transition region. Okay, so melting of rocks, sort of the petrolis point of view of this is from experiments, we know that there's a function of pressure and temperature that as you come up from below, from down here, as you come up, you cross the geothermal, cross the mantle solidus, and melting will begin. And depending upon how far you're across the solidus, you get various amounts of melt. Oop, there you go. So this is kind of the same diagram. And here we should have just kind of superimposed on it the mantle geotherm coming up at about half a degree per kilometer. And the melting region has a slope of something like four degrees per kilometer. And so the geotherm will intersect as you rise up the various melting curves and producing mantle melt that gets extracted at, say, for example, and the, we're using at the mid-ocean ridge. And so the melt comes up as you enter this melting triangle, you begin to melt. So the solidus is here. And as you come up, you produce more and more melt. And that melt gets focused to the low pressure region, which is the, the mid-ocean ridge axis. And the solid mantle residue gets convected off to the side. And so up here, you form the lithospheric plate uh, with the oceanic crust and uh, lithospheric mantle involved. Okay, so that's kind of the process near the, that brings the melt up to the top. But what I want to do is look at some of the details of how this melt actually gets transported. So the important kind of fact that we need to take into account is as the melt ascends from a depth of where it's first produced, 100, maybe 150 kilometers, and ascends towards Earth's surface, it becomes saturated becomes undersaturated in pyroxene. So the melt that comes up deep down is fully saturated in pyroxene, but as you bring that melt up, it's looking more and more for, for pyroxene, it's undersaturated. And so it dissolves the pyroxene, the solubility, restated the solubility of pyroxene and the melt increases with decreasing depth. Therefore, as the melt ascends towards Earth's surface, the melt dissolves pyroxene from the surrounding rock, which could be a lazulite or a Hartsburgite. And this fact is important for the discussion we're, we're going to talk about when we talk about channelized flow. So we have a, basically a reactive melt forming, but as it gets up, it moves up toward the surface, it becomes less and less, um, or needing more and more pyroxene, and so it dissolves the pyroxene out of the out of the lazulite or out of the Hartsburgite rock. Okay, so near the surface brittle fractures occur. And we can talk a little bit about how that happens without going in too much depth into, into to that problem. Um, and so the paths for transporting melt from depth to the surface, at shallow depths we just looked at, you have brittle fractures, formation of dikes. And basically that can happen because the temperature of the rock is relatively low. And the confining pressure, the lithostatic pressure is, is small, relatively small, and conditions that favor brittle fracture. So the low T inhibits plastic, and the, the fact that temperature is low kind of inhibits the fact that you get plastic flow. So at the top, we're going to look at brittle processes. It, the greatest depth um, the greatest depths greater than 100 kilometers, rock flows can be by what's called porous flow, kind of like melt, kind of like water flowing through sand um, kind of problem where the melt kind of is, fraction is small at the onset of melting. And prior to segregation of melt into melt-rich channels, which happens more in more shallow depths, um, the in, there's very intimate contact between the melt and the grain. So the grain, melt is never further than maybe a millimeter from being at the center of a particular grain. So there's good opportunity for the melt to chemically equilibrate in this region. The place where you have chemical disequilibrium between the melt and the channels is in this kind of intermediate region. So if I go back here, sort of in this intermediate region here, the top we had brittle fracture, 
at the bottom we have the initial forming of melt, so it's kind of flow by porous flow. But when you get down to this intermediate or get up to this intermediate region with the melt coming up from below, the pressure is high enough to inhibit brittle, fr brittle fracture or brittle deformation. And the permeability has to be relatively high, so there has to be some kind of high permeability paths that form that are required for melt transport rather rapidly to Earth's surface in order to account for the observation that the melt is chemically out of equilibrium with the mantle rock through which it travels. So that's kind of the key point. The melt coming out in that central region is out of equilibrium with the mantle rock through which it travels. Okay. All right, so T and P, temperature and pressure are very important, have a big control in the mechanisms of rock deformation. Cold rocks usually fracture rather than flow. High pressure inhibits fracture um, and allows ductile deformation or plastic deformation to take place. So at shallow depths, brittle fracture occurs, dikes are formed, um, the temperatures are low, the pressures are low, and that favors brittle plast processes over plastic or flow processes. So there are a bunch of examples. This is one of my favorite examples. It's a rock in my neighbor's yard. This is my dog. He weighs about, uh, what did he decide? He must weigh about 30, 30 kilograms or so. So he's a sizable animal. And this is a granitic rock with some pigmentatic veins cutting through, which are, if you like, kind of brittle fracture, kind of um, dike-like formation pro process that took place to inject that melt, kind of cross-cutting the rock. And, and I'm gonna talk quite a bit and give you some examples from the Oman Ophiolite. <clears throat> and this is kind of the first one. Here are some sheeted dikes that form. So you can kind of see there's a linear feature here. There's clearly a linear feature here. A lot of them have been eroded, but you can see here, there's a series of dikes sitting right basically on top of each other, side to side, one here. If you look up on top, you can see there's one here. You can kind of imagine that there's one in here. And those are all occurring by brittle processes near the surface. And melt. oh, I one more example. This is another ophiolite from Cyprus where you can see the dikes more clearly. And when the melt goes through here, it goes through quickly enough that it basically doesn't have much time to equilibrate with the country rock or the wall rock that it's going past. So there is a series of dike that form. And you can, if you look carefully, and you have your hand lens, you can probably tell that there's a reaction rim between the two dikes. Um, as they inject, one of them is injected hot, the other one is probably cold already, and that allows for some chemistry to occur across that interface. People have analyzed this problem of magma flow through a dike, um, and this is kind of taken from a paper by Spence and Turcott in which they analyzed kind of the velocity flowing through two parallel sided um, structures and the, goes, the melt goes through the velocity. Here I've labeled it D2, so it's rising vertically in the two direction. And the horizontal direction is in the X1 direction. And the dike has a width of, of D from here to here. And you can calculate fairly quickly from the um, from the Poisson flow problem that um, the velocity determined by the width of the dike, um, one over the viscosity of the fluid, so as the viscosity becomes smaller, the magma becomes more fluid, um, the velocity increases, and then it's determined by the pressure gradient. And the pressure gradient is just simply the buoyancy force, and we'll talk about a little bit later on, the buoyancy force that's involved. So if the width of the dike is between a tenth and a meter, the melt basically comes up so quickly, it comes up something like in the order of half a meter per second, the, wall, the melt doesn't have much time to interact with the wall rock. So it comes basically through cleanly and you can analyze the chemistry of that magma that's come through and compare it to the chemistry that you might think that magma should be at. Okay, but the velocity again is really fast. The width of this dike is, again, is maybe a, even if it's a tenth of a meter, 
across. Um, there's not much time for communication between the melt in the center and the wall rock on the outside. So you might expect the chemistry is pretty much preserved once the, the melt gets to that point. Okay, so at greatest depths, so I'm going to jump over the channelized flow region here. At the greatest depth, transport occurs by porous flow. Um, so at the greatest depths, um, the melt fraction is very small, maybe a tenth to 1% melt is formed um, at the onset of melting. And prior to the segregation of the melt into melt rich channels, which happens higher up, um, the flow is taking place by, by this process called porous flow. Again, that's kind of like flowing water through sand. The water contacts the grains at an intimate level, grain by grain, every grain is in contact with, if not totally surrounded by fluid. So this is a sketch of three grains inside of a rock that started to melt. And you can see that basically based on energetic arguments, that the melt is confined primarily to triple junctions. So regions like this where there are one, two, and then the third grain has been plucked out. Um, among triple junctions, and then it goes to these four grain junctions where you have one, two, three, and then a fourth grain that sits underneath that you're not seeing. And if the melt sits on the grain boundaries, because of the energetics, basically it forms isolated pools. So you don't have the melt surrounding the grains, but you have melt in the corners and the edges of the grains, and they makes tubes. And so you can imagine that if melt were coming up from below, it might get into this tube, be transported up, follow a path, go up, go up and up, and out another tube over here. Okay, so that's kind of the structure we're going to think about as we talk about porous flow. It is melt trapped on the two grain junctions. These are triple junctions that separate three grains. And then there are four grain junctions where these corners come together. So that's the, the melt flow path that we're going to talk about. This is a really nice study by Winlu Zhu um, and her research group at the University of Maryland, where they used X-ray tomography at a synchrotron and mapped out, oh, I didn't put a scale bar on, but mapped out at the grain scale. So here you can see a grain, which is maybe um, 100 microns or, or less across. And here you can see these melt rich channels. So 2% melt. The channels are primarily along triple junctions. As you increase the melt fraction to 5%, the structure gets a bit more complicated. And the red parts are just meant to be showing you where the interior part is or the center of the melt, melt channel is. But you begin to get structures that look a bit more planar. And you still have these triple junctions. And then if you go up still higher in melt fraction, you begin to see more planar structures on the interior. Combined with the triple junctions here, for example, and you can see that there's still melt along these tubes. And then when you get up to 20% melt, you can still find some triple junctions with melt in it, but a good part of the melt is now kind of wetting the grain boundaries. Okay, and we'll look at this. So this is kind of the 3D view of the melt. And if you take, go back to this image we looked at just a minute ago with the melt filled triple junctions. And you, you say, well, what does it look like in 2D? Well, if you make a slice through some triple junction, you see what you see in part B here. You have three grains, one, two, three. So it's a triple junction. This is a tube kind of running along a triple junction, such as that section right there. And it's characteristic, characterized by, um, a by a dihedral angle, this angle between in, in the melt between melt, melt, solid, and here between melt and this, this grain over here. And it's connected to a, um, a, a grain boundary that is separating solid from solid here. So you can do a simple force balance on this kind of structure. You can think of these surface energies, energy per unit area, as being surface tensions. And so you can do a force balance. So I Here's the gamma SS, I think of being here, and I just tried to make a maybe a little bit clearer, or hopefully not less clear, um, sketch up here where you have gamma solid solid pulling down here, 
and it's so that's in you know the x direction if you like and you have two got um solid liquid inter interfacial energies or surface tensions pulling back up in the opposite direction so that's pulling up here and pulling up here and if you resolve these two surface tensions um, into a line parallel to this one down here that separates the solid, you can show, oh, didn't, oh, there. You can show that there's this relationship between the solid solid energy between the two grains and the solid liquid interfacial energy. Um, it's just related to the cosine of this angle theta in between. So that's typically how you can take a look at what might happen during porous flow and you can describe the melt structure and at the grain scale where porous flow is taking place. And again, if you look at this in two dimensions, this is a um, scanning electron microscope image, backscattered image um, in a real situation. So here in the previous one, we kind of made it a relatively Instead, all the melt is isolated into a triple and triple junctions. But if you look at reality, you can see that there are some triple junctions, right? So here and here, I can find a triple junction there and there maybe and one nice one over here. But there are also some melt-free grain boundaries, which which we need. So this, these are the solid solid grains between between two two grains, one here and one here, one here and one there. One there and one there. And then, but you also find that quite a bit of melt sits along um, wetted, wetted boundaries. So that there is melt actually separating these two grains. And so there's kind of a combination of flow that you can think of being through um, triple junctions combined with flow that might be going through more planar structures, similar to what we saw in Wim Lu um, X ray tomography images. And if you go in and look at these kind of a, um, in high resolution transmission electron microscopy, here's the structure you see for a melt free sample. So here's the grain boundary, here's the grain boundary, and here's the grain boundary. And if you add just 1% melt, you begin to form these triple junctions, much like in the idealized sketch that I showed you before. And here's a dihedral angle that you could measure and determine something about the relative grain boundary energy of the solid liquid interfacial energy. And if you blow up a region like this, you find that that grain boundary, even if there's melt present, that most grain boundaries are totally melt free. So the structure really is dominated by triple junctions that flow through the triple junctions. But if you go to high enough melt fraction, as in here, you begin to get different wetting structures that carry much more melt than you can carry through a triple junction. Okay, so that's kind of, what these structures might look like. All right, so we're going to have flow to this system. The usual thing is to have Poisson flow through pipes. Okay, and this is kind of the analysis of the velocity of melt flowing through a pipe of diameter r given some pressure gradient. And if you take a whole bunch of those and put them together in a matrix, so here is kind of the melt. You can imagine the melt flowing out at you. So here's the end of a pipe. Here's the end of a pipe. Here's a pipe. So this is kind of one unit cell inside of this structure. <clears throat> we have pipes along all the edges of the cubic grain. And the melt flows along this pipe and out this front surface. And this is just this surface here is any one of these surfaces here. And you can calculate what's called the Darcy velocity, which tells me something about how fast the, the fluid can flow through the this network of pipes um, and you can think of it as a flux or um, the, if you did hydrology you would talk about it as being the Darcy velocity but it's really Darcy velocity is really a flux and it's determined by the melt fraction squared by the grain size b over here um, and by the pressure gradient and by a geometrical factor and one over mu is just simply one over the viscosity of the melt and if you plug in some numbers so the pressure gradient is given by the buoyancy force the difference in density between the mantle rock and the melt phase times the acceleration due to gravity until the grain size of a millimeter 
melt viscosity of 10 pascal seconds. Um, delta rho for this pair here is about 300 kilograms per meter cubed. And if you do that, if you had a tenth of a percent melt with RC velocity of 10 to the 10 meters per second, that is three millimeters per year. So you can imagine a melt moving at that slow rate will very likely stay in chemical equilibrium with, it, with its surrounding. Okay, so the observed, if you do the calculation, so back here I did it, I gave you the result for the flux or the Darcy velocity for flowing through a, tur a tube, and that gives you a dependence of, on a um, melt fraction of phi squared. And if you did it for sheets, it would turn out to be that Darcy velocity or the flux is proportional to uh, phi to the third power. But the important thing here, again, is I just want to reemphasize this, that if you have forest flow at this scale, the melt should remain in chemical equilibrium with the rock through which it's traveling because it's basically in intimate contact with every grain that, that it contacts with. Okay, so in intermediate depths where things get interesting from my perspective, um, the temperature is high, favors plastic flow, uh, pressure is high, suppresses brittle fracture, but you have to have some sort of high permeability paths for rapid transport towards Earth's surface in order to account for the observation, again, that melt is out of equilibrium with the mantle rock through which it travels. So this is one um, photograph of a tabular dunite channels um, going through Hartsburgite in the Josephine prototype in Southwest Oregon. So basically, what you see in this rock is there, it's a Hartsburgite region that's made up of olivine and pyroxene, kind of as a first order approximation. And right next to it is a dunite in which all the pyroxenes have been stripped out and you're left simply with olivine. And what we know is that the morb, the ocean ridge basalt, is out of equilibrium with the Hartsburgite. So it's out of equilibrium with this rock, even though it's flowing through this rock, but it is in equilibrium with dunite. So it's in equilibrium over here. So the dunites, you can think then, must be channels through which the rapid transport of melt is taking place because it's the melt is reactive, it's undersaturated in pyroxene as it comes up from below, resolves the pyroxene out and forms these dunite channels. And so you have melt flow focused along actively forming ductile shear zones, which I'm not really gonna talk about very much in this, in this talk, but I'll talk a bit more about it in the second talk this morning. Okay, so that's kind of a nice, this picture that I really love because it really shows you, first of all, you can walk in the mantle, which I find really, for me, it's really an exciting opportunity. Um, but you can see that you have these two rocks juxtaposed with the, the, the pyroxene having been stripped out of all this rock. So this might have been the original country rock. It's probably more layers of lake than this, um, having more, even more pyroxene than you have here. But you can see that there's, sitting right next to a region where the pyroxenes are basically all removed. So you can think about this happening um, as kind of a chemical way to get melt segregation taking place and forming high, high um, permeability channels, high flux channels where you can flux melt relatively rapid. And then you can think about this as kind of a positive feedback loop and this is kind of the chemical aspect, and I'm going to talk to you in a moment about the a mechanical aspect. But it's a way to segregate melt and then get melt migration that's rapid, more, rap more rapid than you can get by forest flow. So I like to use this triangle that connects the, the critical parameters. So phi is the melt fraction, and the melt fraction is determines the permeability. Remember, permeability goes as phi squared. So if melt fraction goes up, permeability goes up. And if permeability goes up, the melt, here's the relationship between the permeability of Darcy velocity and the permeability. So basically the idea is that if you have a region in the rock where there's maybe a little bit more melt than there is somewhere else in the neighboring regions, the melt is high, the permeability will be high, in that region, and if the permeability is high, the flux to that region will be high. So you have this positive feedback. You increase the melt fraction somewhere in the rock a little bit. That increases the permeability. That increases the flux. And if you have a flux of melt into the region that has high melt fraction, the melt fraction will rise even more. 
So that's one way you can make channels is by having this kind of positive feedback loop between melt fraction, permeability, flux, back to melt fraction. And we've done some experiments to look at this problem and that basically the experimental concept is simple. It's like having a sponge and some water lying on the table. And you take the sponge, you put the corner of it into the water and capillary forces suck the water up into the sponge. So you can think about the sponge as being the rock, the water as being the melt. And so we made high pressure um, react sort of couples between the reactive melt at the bottom and the rock made up of olivine plus pyroxene at the top. Um, and it's subjected to high pressures and high temperatures and see what happens. We organized it, the samples in this way because you might have asked, well, maybe gravity is simply driving the melt down into the rock. But this case, in this orientation, the only thing that's acting up, upward is, is going to be um, uh, capillary forces that are going to draw the melt into, from the reactive source into the rock. So this melt down here is undersaturated in pyroxene. It looks up and says, ah, there's a rock up there that's got pyroxene. I'm going to go have my lunch and eat up all the pyroxene I can find. All right, and if you do this, same sample sketch here, and here it's kind of played out in, in the laboratory experiment. There's melt down below. So this is kind of the reactive melt source. Here's the original interface between the rock and the melt. And then above, you have a rock made up of olivine plus pyroxene, and the melt has migrated in to this point. So the pyroxene is dark in these, these images, and then the melt or the olivine is lighter phase. And so all the pyroxene has been eaten out here. And then at this point, you get this instability developing, and suddenly you have the, this triangle that we just talked about taking jumping into play. And you start, if you have a little bit more melt here, maybe there was a little bit more pyroxene here than there was olivine. Um, and so the, you just start to dissolve it, you make a little bit of an instability, and then that continues to form. And you end up with these channels that are melt rich in the middle. You have olivine up against them. And you have uh, olivine down here. So the olivine kind of continues up in, into the channel, and the melt goes a long way up into the channel. And so you had the original rock up here made of olivine, which I've labeled one, and pyroxene. And it gets replaced by olivine of a different iron content um, down below. And the melt, you get one melt formed here, and then you get a second melt here. So this is just a blow up of this region that I've shown here, where now you have the olivine that's up in here. This is olivine two. It's what's been formed after the reaction. Here's the original rock, olivine or pyroxene being the dark phase, olivine being the lighter phase. And we'll look at chemistry, not in this lecture, but we'll look at chemistry in the next, in the next lecture. And you get this melt channel form. So this is the dunite that forms. Here's the rock that would, and this melt, if this melt gets out, if it's able to leave the system, all you're left with all is with olivine here up against a Hartsford guide or an olivine plus pyroxene rock here. So that's kind of the, the way it works. You have these reactive, in, in, these reactive infiltration instabilities formed. The melt one is undersaturated in orthopyroxene, thus it dissolves the OPX, the orthopyroxene as it goes up, and precipitates olivine of a different composition and forms a melt of a new composition also. Okay, so that's one way to do it. And the second way you can make channels is mechanically. Um, and again, now it's a, a positive feedback loop, um, but having mechanical aspects rather than chemical aspects involved. And here's the same triangle, well, slightly different triangle, that involves the melt fraction, the viscosity. And you can write the viscosity um, kind of mechanically, and then you can write it um, kind of microstructurally, if you like. And so the melt fraction or the viscosity depends on melt fraction. And it's proportional to an exponential term that contains some constant times the melt fraction. So basically, it says as the melt fraction goes up, the viscosity goes down. You can also relate the viscosity to the stress and the strain rate. So tau here is a shear stress, 
gamma dot is the shear strain rate, or you can write it in terms of the normal components. So sigma is the normal st stress, and um, epsilon dot is the normal strain rate. But that's proportional to sigma, or it could be, I could have written it in terms of tau, but it's equal to sigma one minus sigma three. So the maximum principal stress minus the minimum principal stress. And that can be connect, connected to, to pressure. So what makes the, the um, melt flow is a pressure gradient. So we're going to talk about what, what's the origin of the pressure gradient in the mechanical terms. So just to remind you, so when I put that occurrence on the outside of the pressure, it means it's the average pressure. And you can write the average pressure as sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 over 3. Okay, so if it were hydrostatic, sigma one would equal sigma two would equal sigma three, but we can allow for it to be lithostatic or non hydrostatic and make sigma one, two, and three all different from each other. And then in the normal case, experimentally, sigma two is equal to sigma three. That's basically the confining, back up here for a minute. It's basically the confining pressure on the outside. Sigma two might be here and sigma three might be coming in from this side. And so if you rewrite this by including sigma two minus sigma three equal to sigma three, this relaxes to sigma one minus sigma three over three plus some plus the confining pressure term. Okay, so here sigma one minus sigma three comes shows up in the pressure, but it also shows up in the viscosity term. So now we can talk our way through this reaction triangle. Again, if you think of it, you have, maybe have some region that has a little bit more melt than another region. If it has more melt, that means its viscosity must be low. If its viscosity low, is low due to the fact that it has more melt, then that means that sigma one minus sigma three must be, low, must be down, must be low. So you have a low sigma one minus sigma three. I mean, if you plug that into the pressure term, the sigma one minus sigma three gets to be smaller. The pressure gets to be smaller. You know, the pressure goes down. Where does melt flow? Well, melt flows into regions that have low pressures. So melt always flows from high pressure to low pressure, like any fluid. And so it means the melt's flowing into the region that has a high melt fraction, low viscosity, low differential stress, low mean, uh, low mean pressure, and then Luton links back into the, bringing more melt into the region that has melt already. So a positive feedback that again reinforces the regions that have high melt concentrations win the game and get to have more melt in them. Okay. So we've done a lot of experiments over time. And I'm going to talk just what do I want to talk about here. Okay. So this is a sample that was deformed in simple shear. It's a sample primarily made up of olivine plus some mid-ocean ridge basalt and it had trying not to emphasize this, but it had about 20% chromite in it for regions that were important technically doing the experiments. It's basically a simple shear geometry, although probably more accurately, it's really a general shear because there is a little bit of a compression in the vertical direction here. And what you see happening is you have these samples about half a millimeter across. It was sheared out to a strain of about three. So gamma is a shear strain. And you find that the microstructure that formed, oh, it would, although I think probably it wasn't necessary, but we used tungsten pistons that were serrated. So these are the serrations. This is the tungsten, the white part here. And the serrations are where the tungsten pistons invented the sample. And the idea at the time we designed the experiments is getting these serrations to kind of link onto each other might make the, the gripping between the sample and the pistons better than it would be otherwise. Whether or not those were needed is a matter of some discussion yet. All right, so we had serrated tungsten pistons. And what happens is that during the deformation, again, this is not a reactive melt in this case. This is just an olivine plus some mid-ocean ridge with basalt, which the olivine is perfectly happy to be with. But as you shear the sample, top to the right, you form these melt-rich bands. So all these darker regions contain about 20% melt in them. 
And the regions in between, which we call lenses, are melt depleted. So the regions in between have about less than maybe less than 1% melt in them. So the melt is segregated, just kind of following the triangle that we talked about here, is segregated and formed a series of melt rich bands cutting through and separated by melt depleted regions. And these are long lived structures. Um, they evolved during deformation. Um, as you can imagine, the material here is moving off to the right. This part down here is moving back to the left. And so um, these structures persist through strains. You know, they begin to get really prominent after a strain of about one. And you can strain this rock to a strain of 20, and you'll still have a microstructure that has this kind of general appearance to it. OK, so that's kind of a, the, the problem. Um, you can get mechanically formed melt rich bands cutting through and separated by melt depleted regions. And one thing I'll point out, I'm not going to really dwell on this very much. I'll talk maybe a little bit more about it in the second talk. But if you do an analysis of this problem, as, as um, Katz and colleagues at, at, um, did a number of years ago, you predict that the angle at which this, these melt bands should form is, should be at 45 degrees, but they're never at 45 degrees. Well, you might find one at 45 degrees, but most of them are at low angles, lower angles. And the typical angle would be something like 25 degrees, 15 to 25 degrees um, for these melt rich regions. And that comes about for an important region. It comes about because the viscosity of the melt, once you start to deform it, becomes very anisotropic. The melt pockets all align make the viscosity anisotropic. And that can be used to explain why you think it should be at 45 degrees, but why, in fact, the melt bands rotate around to 25 degrees. OK, so we want to talk about melt-rich bands. So let's talk about the Darcy velocity. And let's look at it uh, in simple calculation, which you can do very quickly yourself. Um, we're going to calculate the Darcy velocity for 1% melt and for 25% melt. Those are the parameters that I gave you before. Um, and what you find is that porous flow, which is a flow when you maybe have 1% mill present, gives you a Darcy velocity or a flux um, of about 0.3 meters per year. I mean, it's really a slow moving melt. There's a lot of intimacy between the melt and the grains around it. And so you might expect chemical equilibrium. But if you get channelized flow, i.e. in these channels that form during deformation, if you get channelized flow through those, through those features, which have 25% melt in them, you're flowing at nearly 100 meters per year. And those are the channels that sit in this middle section between the lower part, this by, flow is by porous flow, the upper part where you form dikes. And then in the middle, you have these channels, the melt rich channels that form, maybe have 20% or 25% melt in them. And the melt velocity now is fast enough but there's no way that you're going to have chemical equilibrium between the melt that's going through the channel <coughs> and um, the rock around it. Okay, so channelized flow is fast enough that melt re uh, can remain out of equilibrium with the rock through which it ascends. However, porous flow is slow enough that melt will remain in equilibrium with the rock through which it ascends. So deep down, you might expect chemical equilibrium, but once you start getting up kind of maybe the 50 kilometer range, the, you're going to have porous, you're going to have these high permeability paths that allow melt to be transferred very, very quickly. OK, so I was going to think this is my final slide. So I was just going to ask, which is the most important reaction driven versus stress driven melt segregation? Um, so. Reaction driven melt segregation is clearly important. Um, you can find evidence for it in the presence of dunite channels in ophiolites. So you can't rule out reaction driven melt segregation as being very important. But stress driven segregation must also be important. Um, <coughs> if you go, if you look at these dunite channels that form in ophiolites, you'll find that those dunite channels are also. Uh, regions in which deformation is localized, that is, you form shear zones. And in the next talk, I'll give you some additional evidence for why both stress-driven and reaction-driven melt 
segregation have to be important in, in bringing melt from deep in the mantle to Earth's surface. Um, but let me stop there. I think that's about 45 minutes. And if there are questions, I'm happy to attempt to answer them. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, yeah, it's very good, it's on time. So feel free to ask a question in the chat or just open your mic and ask questions to David. So I always like to say that if nobody has questions and I can give them an exam and they will get it, everything right. Uh, okay, David, how about this? Uh, let's take a break first. And if people okay. ask questions, I think they can leave the question in the chat then we can begin the second lecture by answer, answering questions. That sounds okay. good. Yeah, what time? Uh, 10 minutes from now. Okay, yeah. sounds, sounds yeah. good. Okay, okay, Thank everyone, you. let's take a, take a break for 10 minutes and then we'll come back. Also, feel free to leave a question in the chat. We can provide some tips for reading uh, a an essay or a publication of how to catch the key point. Uh, Johnny, I'm sorry. I I did not understand you. So, so the question left in the chat. So students were asking that it's a general question about how to read a public page. How, how to how to read what? How to read a publication, for example, how to get a key point in a publication, or what, what is your tip, or what is your habit when you read a publication? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, it's something that I think uh, actually is very important. And I think it's tempting to want to read the abstract and the conclusions and maybe the discussion, but not read the methodology. And I think it's extremely important to read the methodology and understand what the person actually did and be critical about not only and I guess if you don't do that, then you have to just believe all the results. So I guess I think it's important to read from beginning to end. And if for me, if the equations get too difficult, probably I skip that section. But in general, particularly if it's an experimental paper, I try to understand exactly what they did and, and critique that part as well. And I guess the other thing I try to teach my students is just because it's written down doesn't mean that it's right. So. You have to really be careful about just because somebody got it published doesn't mean that it's that it shouldn't be challenged. You should be thinking all the time when you're reading professional papers. Okay. Um, okay, so there's another question uh, in the chat. So it's a question from Shulan and asking that. Are there any differences between the channelized flow and a phosphorus flow in the process of rock deformation? Rock formation? I don't mean I think they mean deformation. Okay, can you repeat it one more time? So, is there a difference between so, channelized flow and flow and a and a porous flow during the rock deformation? I think I yeah. think that's yeah. the meaning of rock deformation. That, that, that is a really good question, and the answer is yes. Uh, that if Flow is simply porous flow during deformation. It's you can get yourself into a region in which you probably have something like a steady state behavior. But once channelization begins to occur, the microstructure is evolving fairly rapidly, and you typically develop some shear zones, and the deformation can become unstable, or at least it become doesn't want to evolve towards a steady state behavior because. The channels are constantly evolving during the deformation process. But that's it's really an important question. Okay, so there's another question in the chat. So asking, um, there's a question from uh, Wei Yu Chen and asking a question about the difference. What's the difference between the role of the anisotropic interfacial energy and isotropic interfacial energy? Um, so what is the difference between the role of anisotropic and isotropic 
into right. visual energy? It's, it's, again, it's a really nice question. Um, so if you have a mineral like olivine or like quartz, uh, you pick up a quartz crystal, uh, you can see the different surfaces on it. And that's because the interfacial energy between air and the quartz is anisotropic. Um, and so that part is anisotropic. So you know all the surface energies because the crystal structure, even in a cubic material, um, the interfacial energies are not, are not isotropic. But they're, they're typically anisotropic um, because the structure of the crystal as you come to the surface or the interface between two grains depends upon which interface you choose. And so it's anisotropic and will change from one to the other. Presumably, the, the melt, um, well, maybe not presumably. I mean, the, the melt wetting against, um, say, the A face on a crystal versus wetting properties on a B phase can be quite different because the surface energy of the of those faces are quite different from each other. So there are almost nothing that we deal with that's isotropic. Um, and it turns out, again, it will be very important. And I, I'll try to talk a little bit more about it, but not, not to answer that question, but talk a little bit more about the anisotropic part when I go through the next part of my lecture. I have one slide where we'll look at the microstructures and we can um, speculate a little bit about that. Um, about the surface energies or interfacial energies. Okay, David, let's uh, start on the second part. Okay, so second talk has a, basically the same title as the first talk, but it's meant to be less tutorial and less about the basics and more about experiments and what we find. So once again, we can look at volcanic activity at the surface. And the melt that we look at has come from a long journey. It's traveled 100 kilometers or more to get to the Earth's surface. And we want to talk about how do you get this melt from deep to the surface and what are the, what's kind of the physics and the chemistry of what happens along the pathway between the source melt magma source region and, and where it ropes at the surface. And there are really two points I want to make. Um, First is the one that the melt forms basically fairly deep. If you look at the garnet signature in the basalt, you can find that or argue that the melt forms 100 to maybe 150 kilometers below the surface. And it has to somehow travel that 150 kilometers or 100 kilometers to the surface um, through whatever paths are available to it. And we'll see that those go from forming dikes to channelized flow to porous flow at the very base. And the real observation is um, that people began to really pay attention to in the, in, the, in the 80s and in the 90s, there was a lot of work done. But basically the observation was that the basaltic magma that's erupted and the rock through which it traveled, maybe a layers of light, are not in chemical equilibrium. And that means that the melt must travel fairly quickly, otherwise it should equilibrate with the rock that through which it's traveling. So therefore, we need some sort of high permeability channels to avoid chemical equilibrium. And that's basically what I want to talk about today is how do you form these channels? And you can talk about forming them mechanically, or you can talk about forming them chemistry. So the melt transport paths include some sort of porous flow at the very base, where maybe you're making 1% melt down at 100 kilometers. And the flow at the grain scale, the melt's in intimate contact with the grains, and so are in chemical equilibrium. But as you go up to the upper region, maybe uh, 70 to 30 kilometers or some region in that range, you have to be flowing through channels because this is the region where the melt and the rock through which it's flowing get out of chemical equilibrium. And at the top, you can have magma moving really quickly through brittle fractures. Um, these injection rates can be on the order of a, a meter per second or so. So those are very high, high rates. Kind of the place that I originally got kind of interested in this problem and involved in talking with Peter Kellerman and, and Mike Braun about, about this problem is this image that uh, this photograph that comes from the Oman Ophiolite. And it basically shows that you have dunite superimposed or interlocked um, mass dosing with the Hartsford guide. And the, just, I'm sure you all know, but the Hartsburgite basically is olivine plus orthoperoxine, and the dunite is basically olivine. 
And the argument is that these dunites are the channels through which the melt moved because the melt is reactive and it tends it wants hungry for pyroxene and so it eats the pyroxene out of the out of the Hartsburgite and leaves the dunite behind. Okay, so the argument is that the dunites are melt conduits formed by reaction of basalt to the pyroxene in the Lerzolite or the Hartsburgite. And basalt is in equilibrium with the dunite, but it's not in equilibrium with the Hartsburgite or the Lerzolite because these two phases have um, pyroxene left in them and the dunite has the pyroxene stripped out of it. Okay, so the important point to, to know is that as melts come up from below, as they come up through this path, they become more and more undersaturated in pyroxene. And that's just a petrological fact. Um, and so as the melt comes up, it's looking for pyroxene, eats the pyroxene it finds, makes more melt from the pyroxene and moves and forms these channels in the process. This is another image um, in a mantle peridotite. This is the Trinity Ophelite in nor Northern California. And I love this, this picture. Here's a dunite channel that where all the pyroxene is stripped out. Sitting next to it is a Hartsburgite, and sitting next to that is a Lerzolite. So presumably Lerzolite is the mantle rock through which the melt is traveling. And when it gets into these channels, it sucks all the pyroxene out of the channel and sucks out some of the pyroxene in its neighbor, the Hartsburgite. And so the dunite is all olivine, Hartsburgite is olivine plus orthopyroxene. And the Lerzolite still has clinoperoxene left in it. So the clinoperoxene from the Hartsburgite has gone into the dunite or the melt that was in the dunite channel. The melt is all gone. It flowed out of the, the channel, but it left behind olivine. And we'll see an example of that um, as we go through the talk today. Okay, so down deep flow occurs by porous flow. This is a kind of a microscopic image here are three grains and a melt, all right? So here's, in my, my world, this is olivine, olivine, and olivine. And this is a basaltic melt that's flowing between. And these tubes are channels through which the melt has to flow. So in the porous flow region down deep in the structure, this is what the melt flow looks like. And you get Darcy flow through these channels, but the channels are right up against the grain. So they can chemically equilibrate pretty quickly. I mean, that grain is possibly a millimeter across, and diffusion distances, that means they're half a millimeter or less. So there's good opportunity to chemically equilibrate when you're flowing at that scale. All right, so melting commences at the grain scale. And so there's good intimate contact and it flows through some sort of channels and it flows down the pressure gradient. So it flows from deep in the earth towards more shallow in the earth. So it's, you have buoyancy driving the flow of the melt upward. And you have some melt flux coming out the channel has some permeability assigned to it, um, and you have a pressure gradient. And so you can calculate the Darcy velocity, which is just the flux of melt, is determined by the, um, by the permeability divided by the viscosity of the melt times the pressure gradient. So the bigger the pressure gradient, the faster the melt should flow. And the permeability is usually written out in terms of the grain size squared times some function of the melt fraction. And if it's typical Darcy flow through um, tube, you, this S would be the number two. So it'd be phi squared. What's actually measured by Wen Lu Ju and her group, or student Miller, um, was the permeability in the real rock. And she, they determined that it was the exponent was 2.6, which kind of indicates that flow is going through tubes, but it's also going through sheets. So that's kind of a combination of flow through channels, uh, tubular channels, along grain edges here, and through maybe grain boundaries that are actually wetted to make sheets. Okay, and then you can ask this question, if, if you have low melt fraction versus high melt fraction, how do, much does that influence the Darcy flow? So deep down we have porous flow, which if you had 1% melt for porous flow, the rate would be about a third of a meter um, per year. But if the melt fraction gets up to 25%, that is, you have a channel with a lot of melt in it, the flow velocity is 100 meters per year. So it clearly makes a difference how much melt you have. So if you have 25% melt, you definitely have a channel. If you have 1% melt, you have porous flow around the green edges um, of, the, of, the melt, of the crystal melt system. So 
if you have 25% melt, melt moving fast enough, that it's no way in the world going to chemically equilibrate with the surroundings. And therefore, the melt that comes out if you come through a channel has to be in disequilibrium with the rock through which it traveled. Okay, so we can kind of look at this in this triangle. Um, so the important point is the melt ascending from the source region is undersaturated in pyroxene as it rises. Thus, it reacts with the host rock as it passes through it and can form channels by that reaction instability. Okay, so this triangle basically is a way of saying that there's a coupling and a positive feedback between melt fraction, permeability, which is a function of melt fraction, it was something like five melt fraction squared. And the melt permeability shows up in the flux equation. And so if the permeability goes up, the flux goes up, and the flux goes up, it reinforces the melt fraction. So you can think about a situation where in some region of the rock, you have a little bit more melt than you do in the neighboring regions. So you have a high melt fraction in some region. That means the permeability is higher in that region. The permeability is higher in that region. The melt flux into that region is higher. And so it reinforces and the melt fraction grows in that, that region. And so you have an instability that forms and you build these kind of finger-like structures that, that form due to the instability. And this is just meant to be kind of a cartoon to kind of illustrate this. It's a time, a series of increasing time, T1 to T2, to T1, T0 to T1 to T2. Right, so this is greater and greater time going up. You have a little bump in the melt fraction curve. And it means that the permeability is higher here. That means the flux is higher coming into it and that, perm that instability grows and it gets even stronger. And it's, now you have even more melt in this region. And as you continue to focus the flux into that region, the, the finger grows even bigger. So that's kind of a simple way of saying if I have a reactive melt coming into a rock composed of pyroxene plus olivine, I continue to have melt, but the melt, the reactive melt is eating the pyroxene, giving me a new melt, and I'm only left with olivine behind. And we'll look at that in just a minute. I'm going to skip this pair that I looked at before. We've done this experimentally by having a pressure gradient in an experimental sample. So the sample sits in here. Um, and inside the, the sample, we have uh, three components. At the base of the, we have a reactive melt. Then we have a partially molten rock that maybe has one or two or five percent melt in it. And at the top, we have a sink. And this sink is typically made of porous alumina. And so it's a porous rock sitting on top of partially molten rock and um, a reactive source. And on top of this whole thing sits a, a what we'd call a volume volumometer. So this whole bit here sits inside of a pressure vessel. And at the top of the pressure vessel, this volumometer exists. And so you can use that to measure the pore pressure, right? So if melt comes through and gets into the porous sink, which is filled with argon, it forces the argon gas up into the volumometer and they maintain a constant pore pressure this piston in the volumometer has to back off. It has to move in that direction. And if it does that, you can figure out how much melt has gotten into this porous rock by measuring how much argon shows up in this volumometer section. OK, so you, again, you maintain this at constant pressure. And as melt comes into this in here, it forces the argon out, goes up here, pushes this piston back because you're controlling it, this piston at constant pressure. OK, so that's kind of the experimental setup. Here's just kind of an, another version of it. Reactive melt source, partially molten rock, porous sink. OK, so the porous sink, again, is aluminum oxide that has a porosity of about 20%. So it's interconnected porosity. And partially molten rock is typically 50-50 olivine plus pyroxene plus a few percent melt. And the reactive melt is an alkali basalt and then we dope it or spike it with a weight percent ytterbium, which is a heavy element. And so when we do later on look at this by x-ray tomography, we can find the melt phase relatively easily. OK, so that's kind of the system. So here's two samples for comparison. This one in which there was no pressure gradient involved. And this is what the sample looks like. Um, this is all the samples all enclosed in an iron jacket. <clears throat> 
that's been colored just to kind of show you the different sections. So here's the melt source, here's the rock, and here's the sink for melt. <laughs> and if you apply a pressure gradient <clears throat> across the sample, so that it's high pressure down at the bottom, 300 megapascals, and lower pressure at the top, maybe 100 megapascals, you have a pressure gradient, and that squeezes the melt sink, forces some of the melt into the into the rock, and then some of the melt squirts out and ends up in the sink, in the, you know, in the porous aluminous sink. Okay, this is the cut through these two samples. So this is the whole whole sample, and and we're going to make a cut through. We're going to cut through and expose the center line in the sample. And this is what it looks like. So here's the melt source again. Here's the rock, partially molten rock with pyroxene and olivine in it. And here's the sink. And you can see if you don't have a pressure gradient, a little bit of melt gets through, but not a whole lot. In contrast, if you have a high pressure gradient, where the pressure gradient is 85 megapascals per millimeter, you end up with a lot of melt up in the sink region. And it's traveled from the source down here through the partially molten rock, eating up pyroxene as it goes, and then up out here in the sink. And you can see the different shape of the, the melt source because this one's been squeezed um, by 300 megapascals in, in order to force the melt to shoot up through the, through the sample. Okay, and if you change um, the um, pressure gradient that's driving the melt flow and you look at melt volume in the sink, as a function of time, and again, you do this using the volumometer to measure, actually measure how much gas is pushed out of the, the porous sink. You can see that if you go to higher pressure, melt flow is faster than it is if you go to do the experiment at low pressure. And this kind of kink in the curve is the point at which the first channel breaks through. And there you'll we'll see a channel coming through the partially molten rock and contacting um, the porous sink. And once that happens, once you get a channel formed, melt rich channel form, the flow of melt is really quick and you end up shutting down the experiment pretty quickly. So this is a series of x-ray tomography images of the channel morphology. So here's a case, the three samples. The first one, there's no pressure gradient. So here's the source, here's the rock, and the sink is up here and it's not shown. If you apply a pressure gradient for a short time, you see the melt now is shown in red. You see the melt having gone from the source through the rock. And so this is the melt coming through the rock and then ending up in the sink up on top. And if you go for a longer time, you see more channels. And the thing you can notice is that some of the channels go all the way through. And it's when this channel breaks through that the melt flow suddenly becomes really quick and the volume of melt in the sink changes very quickly. And I tend to find that the bigger melt channels are the ones that make it all the way through to the top. Okay, and this is just another set of images. Um, similar thing, just viewed. This one, again, is viewed from the side of the channel. Um, melt source is down here, melt sink is up here, and here are the channels cutting through the, through the olivine rich rock. And this is just kind of a downward view. And you can see there's some big channels and there's some small channels. And the small channels tend not to have gotten all the way up to the top into the sink, but the big ones have popped through and gotten into the sink. Okay, so this again is um, a rock that has um, no pressure gradient and there's a little bit of advance to the front by capillary forces. So basically capillary forces suck some of the melt into the rock, but only a very tiny distance. So this is two millimeters. So maybe 10 microns or 50 microns transport of melt in, but that interface state basically stays very stable. But if you have, um, a pressure gradient driving the melt flux, in this case at 72 megapascals per millimeter, you begin to form these instabilities, these reaction infiltration instabilities. And they're really interesting um, in that melt is flowing upward into this channel and you're getting some of the, um, oh, I think I have them labeled, let me see. Yeah, I do. So here you get re the reaction front is advanced here. But with the pressure gradient, you also get these channels, melt rich channels forming. And at the base of the channels, you get these um, olivine phenocrysts that have been basically caught up in the flow 
and carried up to the top and deposited it here. So they're in the melt to start with, and they can end up being wafted up to, to the base of the channels. Um, and it's interesting, you see that phenocris, group of phenocris, and you don't see a channel. And that's because they're three-dimensional structures. The channels are really like fingers shooting through, and they're not even straight fingers. They're kind of crooked fingers going from the source. And so this one must be olivine phenocris that have gotten brought up to that point. But there must be a channel in the third dimension behind the screen, or, or maybe it was polished away. Um, and you can see the same thing over here. There's a lot of phenocris. Um, there must be a channel somewhere, but it's not, you can't see it in this two dimensional section. Uh, here's another example with a similar pressure gradient, 4% melt. I think the previous ones were 20% melt. Here's 4% melt. The channels are not as well as developed, but there's a channel. And there's a big pile of phenocrusts here, but you can't see the channel again because it's sitting somewhere in the third dimension. So that's kind of the experiment. And if you go in and look at the channels, um, you can see that the channels tend to be melt rich in the center. They have a lot of melt in them. Here are some of the phenocris that are being drug up in the flow of melt going into the channel. And here's the olivine that's precipitated out of the system. So here's the host rock, it's olivine plus paroxene. The melt melts reaction. So here's the reaction layer, the initial reaction layer at the bottom. All right, and then here's the region in which channels have begun to form. And in this reaction layer, you have olivine only, the paroxene's been stripped out. Um, and that olivine continues only up into this region. And these big grains, again, are, are carried up in the flow. They're carried up from below. Um, and so this is the partially molten rock that has paroxene, climoperoxene, olivine, um, and a, bit, a small amount of melt present in it. OK, so that's the kind of, uh, channel morphology. And you can see this one's really kind of interesting. It comes up. And suddenly it looks like it disappears, but that's only because it's gone into the third dimension. It's like taking your finger and bending it. And you see part of the finger below, but you're only looking at a two-day cut, two-dimensional cut. And so you see it come out up above. And here you can see really clearly that the core is melt, olivine on the outside of it, and then the two-phase rock over in the side. You can do the chemistry of melt of, of the channel. Um, and this is looking particularly at iron. And you can see um, that the iron is richer after the melt's gone through. So the reactive melt leaves an olivine behind that has more iron than in the host rock. Okay. And you can look at uh, melt composition. So this is looking at calcium oxide, which is primarily, in this case, in the melt. So here's relatively low cal calcium oxide content in the melt, but it's much higher here because the clinoperoxene, which has calcium in it, has been dissolved into the melt, leaving olivine behind. So you see really clearly the olivine that's been formed by the reaction and the melt that's, that's been, been left behind. And this is SiO2, and you can see there's SiO2 differences in, in the channel and in the outside. And you can see here for aluminum oxide, you can see the that the melt chemistry changes kind of locally as you look around, it's um, enriched in in um, aluminum near the sample and inside even there must be some sort of circulation going on that you can have these disparate, these disparate compositions in, um, in the aluminum content in the melt. Okay, so some conclusion for this first part of my talk. Um, reactive melt migration results of melt channelization. Melt with channels consist of olivine plus melt with no paroxene. Channelization increases the bulk permeability so that once you get up, you make these channels, melt can flow like crazy through them. And that's why we saw earlier that if you look at melt volume as a function of time, um, that suddenly you get this breakthrough and the melt flows really at a wicked fast pace from the, from the source region into the sink because it has a, basically a 100% melt channel to flow through. Um, and the melt channels have crooked finger-like morphology. And they're not tab tabular as found in ophiolites. And I'll come back to this point later on after we talk about deformation um, and how you can make channels by deformation. Okay, so that was the chemical route. But you can also get stress-driven melt segregation and again, form a positive feedback loop. 
um, which has kind of a mechanical aspect now to make it get melted, getting melt to segregate and to migrate. Okay, so this is the deal. Here's our triangle again. And now we're coupling melt flux or melt fraction with viscosity with pressure gradient. All right, so we have some region where melt fraction goes up for whatever reason. It's kind of statistically a little bit higher than it is in the neighboring region. If that's the case, what you need to know is that the melt viscosity depends exponentially um, on melt fraction. So if melt fraction goes up, negative sign in here means the viscosity goes down. So melt, increasing melt fraction gives rise to decreasing um, viscosity. And you can relate the vis viscosity to the applied stress, the differential stress, sigma one minus sigma three. And you can show that the pore pressure is equal to sigma one minus sigma three over three plus sigma three. So if this is the case, if the vis viscosity goes down because you've increased the melt, so you've increased the melt, viscosity goes down, viscosity goes down, the applied stress goes down, assuming that you hold strain rate constant. If the stress goes down, the mean pressure goes down. And the mean pressure goes down, where, where does the melt like to flow? It likes to flow to the low pressure regions, that is the high melt, melt fraction regions. And so you get this similar kind of triangle to the chemical that we had for chemistry. You get it mechanically, high melt fraction leads to lower viscosity, leads to lower pressure, Lower pressure gives a flux of melt and leads to higher melt fraction. And so again, it's an instability of a positive feedback loop between melt fraction, viscosity, and pore pressure. And melts always flow down pore pressure gradients. Okay, so I'm gonna talk just for a minute and show you a couple of examples of deformation. Um, and somebody asked before a really good question about what happens when melt begins, begins to channelize. And you can see it here, the plotting the stress versus strain. And these are samples that are deformed at a constant rate of deformation. So you think about this maybe as pulling on a rock at a constant rate and at looking at what the stress does as, and as strain in, as a function of strain, the more you pull, the more rate of the strain. And if you look at the first one, um, the slower rate, the channels are beginning to form, but they form relatively slowly. At the higher rate, when you're pulling more quickly, you have a higher stress to drive the, the uh, melt flow. You get this drop off in stress. And this is kind of a real definite indicator that melt channels are forming. So here yet, you may be having deformation by porous flow, involving porous flow. But up here, when the rock gets weaker, you form a melt rich region. And if you have a melt rich region, it's basically a shear zone. So you're getting deformation from localized into that melt rich region. If you plot this up, as we tend to do in looking at mechanical properties, you plot it up as strain rate as a function of stress, then you can show that as you increase the melt fraction, the rock is getting weaker. And getting weaker is equivalent to saying the viscosity is getting smaller. So these are constant rate experiments, or constant stress experiments, and you look at the strain rate and you get things deform faster, um, as you have more melt. Um, and you can write that out experimentally. In this particular case, for anorthite plus melt samples, the strain rate goes as um, something like 24 times the melt fraction. If you write that as viscosity, the strain rate ends up in the denominator and it's proportional to exponential of minus 24 times the melt fraction. So this is kind of the thing that causes the rock to become weaker once you've introduced some melt into it. I love this figure from this article by Dave, Dave Stevenson and the paper he wrote in 1989, kind of anticipating what ultimately we found experimentally. He makes this plot of melt fraction as a function of distance. And the little squiggly line here is the starting melt distribution, okay? And there are some places where there's a little bit more melt, maybe right next to it, there's a little bit less melt. And if there's more melt, it's weaker, its viscosity is lower. The viscosity is lower means that the differential stress is lower. The differential stress is lower and the pressure is lower. So the melt flows from this melt poor region into the melt rich region and this melt rich region grows. And so he kind of shows this kind of schematically as a series of melt rich regions and separated by regions that are 
pour and melt. All right, and that's this kind of, again, it's instability that forms. And the assumption, again, is that the strain rate is spatially constant. So the melt fraction goes up, the viscosity goes down, the viscosity goes down because it's dependent, dependent on melt fraction. If the viscosity goes down, it means the stress goes down. So it's the viscosity is proportional to the stress. If the stress goes down, the mean pressure goes down. If the mean pressure goes down, that means the melt fraction goes up because melt is flowing down the pressure gradient. And so the melt flux is just given by, because melt flux is given by the pressure gradient, the negative of the pressure gradient. So melt flux, melt's flowing from low pressure regions, sorry, from high pressure regions into low pressure regions. And so you get this positive feedback, it takes you back to the top, the melt fraction is enhanced, viscosity goes down, et cetera. And so you have this positive feedback mechanism that for forming melt risk channels. So this is a micrograph of a sample that was sheared containing basaltic melt um, plus olivine and sheared out to a strain of three. And the first thing you, you really see is that the melt kind of at the grain scale already is beginning to get organized. And you get kind of alignment of melt at about 25 degrees to the applied stress or to the applied shear stress. Um, and predictions would, would be that this should really be at 45 degrees. But the reason this is really important, and I'm not going to spend any time on it in this lecture, um, is that this means that the viscosity of the rock is very anisotropic. And as you can imagine, you can see you have this anisotropic structure of melt and grains. It's not surprising that the viscosity of that rock should also be anisotropic. And that turns out to be really important in the segregation process. So this is a rock that was sheared. I showed it in the previous lecture, sheared a strain of three, it's olivine plus more, plus it had quite a bit of chromite in it. And what you form is you form these melt-rich bands that have 15%, maybe 20%, maybe even 25% melt in them. And they're separated by these melt-depleted regions. So this is exactly the situation that um, Stevenson envisioned, that you get melt segregation, you form melt-rich bands. Well, if there's 20% melt in that band, it's got a very high permeability. I mean, melt can whip through it really quickly. Whereas in these regions that have been stripped of melt, and have less than 1% in them, the permeability to those are really, it's really pretty low. Again, so this is a simple shear sample, about a half millimeter across, and you form the smell segregation problem. Kind of similar in, in appearance in some ways um, to what, what the, happened during chemically. But the interesting thing about these is that these are planar structures. In the chemical case, we talked about as being finger-like structures that formed. But here you have planar structures. And again, you expect that to happen at 45 degrees, but they're really down at 25 degrees due to the viscous anisotropy of the system. We've also done a lot of these deformation ex experiments on, in torsion. So this is a sample. This is the iron jacket on the sample, the partially molten samples here. Um, and you twist it, and you can see that it's been twisted through one complete revolution, which corresponds to a shear strain of about three in the sample. At 1200 degrees centigrade, 300 megapascals. When you're done, you take the sample out, you, you cut various sections. And typically, what I'm going to show you is going to be the tangential section, because it's the section that basically is undergoing simple shear. And then you can look at the center section also, which has a lot of informa information in it, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, but suffice it to say that you can, all, it's important to look at both sections. But here, it's nice to look at this section because it, it has kind of a simple um, deformation geometry. Okay, so here's the tangential section of that rock. So here's the full sample. Here's the radial section that I said I wouldn't talk about. Here's the tangential section on the outside. And again, you have melt rich channels um, formed that have about 20% melt or so in them. And they're separated by melt depleted regions that have less than 1% melt in them. And you get this whole family of melt rich bands now. Um, and this is when Lu Ju did, did some nice um, tom X ray tomography on the sample. I'm going to see if this works, I hope. I'm going to show you a movie of, of this section. So this is just a section through the sample we just looked at previously. So it's a, it's a chunk of this sample. 
and looked at in X-ray tomography, and the, the orange bits are the melt, and the, the grains have been blanked out, so you don't see them. I hope I don't regret this. Okay, here we go. So here's going to be the, the movie. So here's that section. And now you can really see that, that these are form planar structures, right? So if you wanted to talk about tabular dunites, these are tabular features. They're two-dimensional. And there's a whole series of them. They're roughly periodically spaced, not quite periodically. And you can do analyses of all kinds on looking at the spacing between the bands, the amount of melt in the bands, and so it all, out all kinds of physical properties of, of what's going on. But now you have these high melt fraction channels, and so you can move melt through them very quickly. Uh, hope I'm closing the right thing. Good. Okay, so that's just kind of a way of illustrating what goes on. Here's a series of samples of that anathite plus melt um, deformed in torsion. And as you add more and more melt, here's 1% melt, here's 12% melt. You see the more and more melt gets pushed into the channels. And again, you get these melt rich bands or channels, planar structures, and they're anastomosing. They're not all kind of planar to each other, but they really cross cut each other and it gives a way that melt can move from one channel into another channel. And basically, as you share this, these channels have to rotate up. So this channel might eventually rotate up to this kind of orientation. And then when it gets much higher than that, the pressure is so great in it, it forces the melt out and it goes back into lower, lower, lower angle bands. <clears throat> okay, so what do we know about stress-driven melt? Stevenson predicted that you get spontaneous, small-scale melt segregation in deforming rocks due to its dependence, the dependence of viscosity and melt fraction. Mark Spiegelman next analyzed this problem using a linear analysis approach, and he determined that the bands should be oriented at 45 degrees, which they never are. Then Rich Katz came in later um, when he was a student of Mark Spiegelman and predicted that the band angle should be 15 degrees, but only if the stress exponent was, was something like six. So it was very nonlinear flow. And back here, we've demonstrated where, where the stress exponent is unity, um, that you get these bands. So it, it's, it's not necessary to have such a high power law viscosity. And then Yasuko Takaya and Ben Holtzman in 2009 were able to explain this lower, end or lower angle of the, band, <clears throat> of the bands by introducing anisotropic viscosity, which arises, as I tried to point out, due to the alignment of melt pockets in response to the applied shear stress. So you don't need to have Newtonian viscosity. You simply need to have anisotropic viscosity to get the band formation angle right. So we might sort of end by asking the question, um, which is more important, stress-driven or reaction-driven melt segregation? And I think the answer is ultimately going to be both of them play a role in what's going on. And I'll try to explain that. So reaction-driven melt segregation is clearly important, as you can, as is evidenced by looking at the tabular dunites that are formed in opilites. But the dunites are tabular, they're not fingers. And if you just had reaction driven, um, you might expect that the opilites should have finger shaped dunite bodies rather than tabular shape or planar shape structures. Stress driven melt segregation must also play a role, as demonstrated by the morphology of the channels, which is planar or tabular and not finger like. So there's you can make arguments that both of these mechanisms, uh, reaction-driven flow and stress-driven flow, must be important. We actually have some done some experiments a, a while ago in which we combined, tried to do, do this problem with looking at combining reaction um, and deformation to see if it gives greater infiltration. And it does. You find that if you look at how far the melt has infiltrated during deformation um, when you have a reactive melt. It turns out the melt travels quite a bit further than it does with deformation alone. And that melt segregation associated with deformation, um, it kind of helps you set up the, the initial condition for the chemical process to take place. It basically creates kind of changes, local fluctuations in melt volume, 
that makes structures that have um, no fractions that vary along the source the sink interface, which can act, act as nucleation points for the reaction of enhanced. So I think there is a coupling between the two um, that melt the deformation actually helps in a way to, to get the the um, to get the the chemical part going. So I'm gonna I think I'm gonna stop there. I could talk. Do, am I? I'm not sure how long I've talked. Oh uh, yeah, I think it's okay. Uh, we are uh, flexible. You have a reason for five minutes, so that's okay. If you like, okay. to, yeah, yeah. What? I'll stop here and thank you for, or should I, I'll, no, let me talk about this just for a minute. And this is, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, sure, is some, sure, this is an, an analysis done by Katz and Takai, uh, Rich Katz and Yasuko Takai, where they looked at what happens in a torsion deformation experiment. And they showed that melt should flow from the inside and the solid should flow out. So you end up with melt segregation in the center. And Chi Chow, did the experiments where he deformed some samples in torsion. So this now is looking down on the torsion sample. Uh, so in this picture, it's looking at this surface up here, probably midway through. It's probably cut halfway through the sample. And what you see in this optical micrograph, you can see these dark lines, which are melt-rich channels flowing to the in center, and they're getting darker at the inside. He segmented it and did a binary image. And you can begin to see that it looks like there's more melt in the center than there is in the outside, consistent with prediction. And then he um, made a, a binary, from the binary image, he made a melt, melt fraction map. And now you can really see that the color scale is telling you how much melt there is. And now I think you can see that it's quite a bit lighter in the middle than the outside. And this is a process that's unrelated to the channels. It's what Rich with cats and, the, and um, the Kai called base state melt segregation. And it basically is flowing from the pressure gradient being high at the outside to being lower on the inside. And then Chow, Chi Chow analyzed this by kind of taking radi radial sections around and then plotting the melt fraction as a function of position. So here's the center of the sample where the melt fraction is a little bit elevated. And then um, it goes out the outside where it begins to drop off. This is an, an ex interesting experimental artifact that somehow is related to the fact that it goes up rather than going down. So the solid line, this theory, and the data points are the experiments. And we don't really totally understand why, but somehow the jacket and the sample are interacting so that you end up with a little bit higher melt fraction on the outside than you might expect. But otherwise, the fit is pretty good um, between the theory and the experiments showing that you really do get this base state melt segregation or melt flows from the outside in the torsion experiment toward the center. All right, that's it. Thank you. Happy to try to answer questions. Okay, questions from our participants today. Feel free to open your mic or leave your question in the chat and I could read a new question on every time. I'll be right back. I'll be back in a minute, okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I'm back to further questions. Well, I'm always happy when I explain things so perfectly that nobody has a question that comes out of it. Wait a minute. 
Oh, they did it. Oh, okay, that's the question. So, so you haven't, uh, Neil Talk, you haven't talked about Deep Mantle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd like to, to hear your opinion about the reaction driven as well as thread driven uh, flow of a melt in Deep Mantle. Although in Deep Mantle, the melt uh, is likely burned to be very low proportion uh, compared with like a more sort of sure. large beginning uh, province and storage, et cetera. So I'd like to hear your perspective on it. So the, this is what at the at the base of the upper mantle is that what you're thinking or you, the deep mantle? Do you mean the deep in the yeah. lower we're, mantle? We're, we're, yeah, we're gonna start from the deep of upper mantle all the way to the full mantle boundary. <laughs> That's asking a lot, but <laughs> and it's a problem I've not thought too too much about. I mean, at some point, of course, there's an inversion, and the melt becomes more dense than the rock. And actually flows downward. The pressure gradient drives it downward. Um, and but I think all the same physics applies. I mean, I don't think there's anything unique about about the, the physics of this problem. I mean, if you have deformation, it will cause segregation to occur, even if the melt doesn't have reactive component to it. And um, if there's some reason to have disequilibrium, then these reaction instabilities are really interesting. And I mean, they're seen in lots of other settings besides just the partial melt one. That it's a whole field that's built up in the material science field of talking about what happens if you have a, a melt um, that's out of equilibrium or not even necessarily a melt. Sometimes people worry about it. If you pour acid into a system that dissolves in the acid, it, it will form similar instabilities. Um, I don't know if you can do it with groundwater because it's probably not reactive enough to to cause similar thing to happen. But any any case where you have a fluid that's out of equilibrium with the surrounding rock or the surrounding material, be it rock or, or elsewise, um, you're bound to get some kind of reaction taking place, and channel it causes channelization to occur. <laughs> Any more questions for our participants? So I should just thank all of you for being patient and listening. I know I speak really quickly, but I'm used to being around Johnny, whose English is really good, and I. My wife asked me this evening, "Is how good is the English of all the students?" And I said, "I have no idea, but if they, <laughs> if they speak as clearly and as quickly as Johnny does, probably it's okay. But I suspect that's not the case." Well, uh, I think English probably is okay, uh, but I do think that the topic uh, is a little beyond what the undergraduate students should be absorbed yeah. by the first time. But so a few things that we have the recording, so for students who are interested in being able to watch the video all the time. And getting through it. Uh, I think that's an advantage now that you have Zoom in rather than before. Yeah. And part of your record. So it's actually, it could be a very good uh, learning practice uh, 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 like the material. I, I do like David's classes before, and I hope that uh, whether you get uh, you retire, I hope that your classes somehow that you've got to re record it one time so that it doesn't disappear from there. Because <laughs> it's still circulating among students. Yeah. Good. Well, maybe to be of some use. Okay. So, shall I say goodbye? Yeah. Uh, have a good day. Uh, have a good evening, David. Good. Uh, thanks Thank to you. everyone for your participation. Okay. Bye bye. Best of luck to all of you. Bye bye. Yeah. By the way, we could open our video, everyone, uh, to show our appreciation for our speaker today. And also, we take a good picture. So I think that'll take a bit less than 20 <laughs> seconds that everyone can easily open the video. Okay. Could anyone try to get some screenshot? Uh, okay. Uh, have a good day, everyone. Bye bye.